middle aisle right there. All right, Hebrews chapter number 5. Hebrews chapter number 5 tonight. I want to give just another quick introduction as I have each week. Number one, I want to remind you the authorship of the book of Hebrews. And that is, of course, Paul. Paul was the author of the book of Hebrews. This is debated, but I believe that it is extremely clear. And there's a couple of reasons why I believe that that's important. And I'm going to focus on one of them later on in the sermon tonight. Number two is to understand who it is directed to, who is being addressed, and that is the Hebrews. That is the Jews of the Old Testament. They were God's people under the Old Covenant. And that is extremely important under, uh, to understand because of some of those tougher passages that we looked at in the past couple of weeks. But not only that, it is important to understand because of the content of the book of Hebrews. It is written to a people that are already familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. If you read through the book of Hebrews, one of the things that you may notice is that how he casually just brings up you know, teachings of the Old Testament. And we're going to see that here in Hebrews chapter number 5 in the very beginning. And also, I want to make this other quick statement. We're going to start shifting gears here in Hebrews chapter 5. There's going to be a brief intercession or just a, you know, a, 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 an intermittent pause, intermittent pause in Hebrews 6 where it's just kind of parenthetic and he kind of addresses, you know, the, the, the Hebrews in the sense of enduring, you know, kind of prodding them to endure in their Christian life. But with Hebrews chapter number 5 is where really the deep doctrine begins. And this is one of the things why I love the book of Hebrews because it really shows the power of God's word. All of the deep knowledge and, and just treasure troves of wisdom that is found in God's word. And what the book of Hebrews does is it really relates to just the whole Old Testament. Because a lot of books in the New Testament don't do that. But the book of Hebrews, it is written to a person, written to a people that should be familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. Now... How many people are in here are saved tonight? Amen. Amen. Amen, right? Now, now, some may be saved, you know, very recently, but let me say this. If you are a saved believer, you are expected to know the Old Testament scriptures. Now, you know, if you just got saved, obviously, you know, there's, there's a difference there. But a Christian is supposed to know and understand the Old Testament scriptures. A, a, a Christian is supposed to be familiar with the Bible. Keep in mind this. What did Jesus call Cleopas and the other man when they were walking on the road to Emmaus because they were not familiar and did not understand the Old Testament scriptures? He said, oh fools, right? Now, of course, a person that's just saved, that's totally different. But a person that's been saved for many, many years, we are expected to know the Bible. We are commanded to study to show ourselves approved unto God. So this book is not just two Jews. It's written for you too. It's written for all Christians. And you should be able to read through the book of Hebrews and this should make sense to you. When we start getting into these deep doctrines, if you're not understanding things, then you need to read your Bible more often. If, you're, if, it's, if a lot of this stuff is just going way over your head, maybe you need to go back to the Old Testament and read the Old Testament you know, a little bit more. And here in the book of Hebrews, starting tonight, we're going to really start getting into more of the deep doctrine of the Old Testament and tying in the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. And like I said, keep in mind, chapter 6 is going to be a brief pause, but chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 are all just deep doctrines of the Old Testament being expounded deeper, being explained deeper from other angles. Things, you know, uh, uh, the, the Apostle Paul, obviously through the uh, you know, uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is able to you know, just show us things that you would have never noticed on your own without the help of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Just amazing things. So right here, Hebrews chapter number 5, verse number 1. We're going to go ahead and delve into this and begin tonight. It says this, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and and sacrifices for sin. So notice that the person he's writing to needs to be familiar with what a high priest is, right? Uh, you know, another name for the high priest is also chief priest. That's another name in the Old Testament that the high priest will go by. But the, the sons of Levi, obviously there was 12 tribes of, of you know, uh, Israel. There were 12 sons of Jacob and 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. One of them was the Levites. 
Everyone that came from Levi was the Levites, right? They were the Levites. And of the Levites, their job was to be ministers at the tabernacle, right? They were to be ministers at the tabernacle. Now, a specific line that came from Levi, which was of the sons of Aaron, were to be the priest. And they were to specifically minister in certain things. And we're going to get into that right now. That's who the high priests were. They were of the sons of Levi. But even more specifically, they were of the sons of Aaron. And their job was to minister in the tabernacle. So it says this, for every high priest. So he's the, basically the, the head of all the priests, right? Or a, and also the head of all the Levites. For every high priest taken from among men. So notice he's taken from among men. He's selected out from men. Is ordained. That just means appointed. For men in things pertaining to God. So right there, what's the purpose of a high priest? What is the reason of a high priest? It's for men. That's what it tells you, that the purpose of the high priest is ordained for men. That's their reason. That's important. We're already learning important things here. They're ordained for men in things what? Pertaining to God. So it's things that has to do with God, right? Now specifically, look at the last clause there in verse number 1. The last statement of what they were ordained for men and what for. That he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now what's the purpose of the high priest? It's to offer sacrifices, right? To, it says gifts first, both gifts and sacrifices for sins. That is the purpose of the high priest. You say, what's the purpose of the high priest in the Old Testament? To offer gifts and sacrifices. That's the purpose of the high priest in the Old Testament. Notice that he's taken from among men. What does he have to be? He has to be a man, right? He has to be a man. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is our high priest and he is a man. He's ordained for men. So he's ordained for us. That high priest in the Old Testament he was ordained for the Israelites. The Lord Jesus Christ being our high priest, and I'm going to get into this, he's ordained for us. That's why he was ordained. Look at verse number 2. Who? Now that there is referring to the high priest. Who can have compassion on the ignorant. So he's able to have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. Talking about the, you know, the sinner, if you will, right? Them that are out of the way. For means because that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Verse number 3, 2 and 3 go together to make this uh, help make sense here. Verse number 3, and by reason hereof, so by reason of what we just read in verse number 2, I'll explain that in just a second, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. So verse number two explains that the high priests of the Old Testament, which were of the line of Levi and specifically of the line of Aaron, that they were sinners because they were taken from among men. So they were sinners, right? They were compassed about with infirmity. They were sinful themselves. And then verse number three says, and because of this, because they were sinners and by reason hereof he ought, saying he, he, he needs to do this, as for the people so also for himself to offer for sins. So it's explaining that because he's a sinner, when he goes and offers an offering, he doesn't offer an offering for just the people. What does he have to do as well? He has to offer that offering for himself. And why? Because he is also a sinner. Because that man, that high priest, he was just a man. He was just a normal man and just as much a sinner as you are. Or Aaron, if you will, as the chief priest or as the first high priest of the nation of Israel. He was just as much a sinner as all of the nation of Israel. Just as much. There was no difference in him as far as his sinful nature. He was a transgressor. As was all of the nation of Israel. So when he went in to offer that offering and offer the gifts and the sacrifices, he had to offer a sacrifice for himself because he's also sinful and he needs to atone for his own sins, right? That's of course not for spiritual salvation in order to get to heaven, right? It's reconciliation for, you know, their relationship with God. So he would offer that offering and this, you know, would, would hold their relationship well with God and then he would also offer the offering for all of the people. So that's very important. I want you to look at verse number uh, uh, Four, actually, yeah, we'll read verse 4 and then we'll, we'll go to the Old Testament. i got a couple of verses I want to show you here. Verse number 4. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, 
as was Aaron. I want you to go to the Old Testament. Go to Leviticus chapter number 9. Leviticus chapter number 9. This actually has to do with what we were just uh, uh, talking about and what we read there in verse number 3 about how the, the chief priest or the high priest, when he went into the holiest of holies, or he went into the holiest of all, he had to give an atonement or he had to offer that gift or sacrifice for the people, but first he had to offer the sacrifice for himself. I want to show you this in the Old Testament. Look at Leviticus chapter 9, look at verse number 6. It says this, And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded that ye should do. And the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. Verse 7, And Moses said unto Aaron, Aaron was the first high priest, Go unto the altar and offer thy sin offering. So what is this first? It's his. It's for Aaron. This is his sin offering. Thy sin offering and thy burnt offering. And then he says this, and, so this is afterwards, or I'm sorry, this is still speaking about him, and make an atonement for thyself. And then he says this, and for the people. So that follows afterwards, the one for the people afterwards. Look at what it says further. And offer the offering of the people and make an atonement for them as the Lord commanded. So notice that first he's supposed to go in, and there's a very specific order of this, right? First he goes in and he offers the offering for himself. And he repeats that a couple of times, just as the Bible does, uses repetition to teach us. Then it explains that then you're supposed to afterwards offer an offering for the people. You're supposed to uh, offer the sacrifice for the people, or the gift, as it calls it in Hebrews chapter number 5. So uh, you should keep your hand there in Hebrews chapter number 5 each time we turn to any other passages. You know we're going through uh, Hebrews chapter 5. So go back to Hebrews chapter number 5. We're going to read verse 4 and then I want to show you another verse in the Old Testament. So we saw there in Leviticus 9 where the high priest Aaron that is supposed to offer the offering for himself. Then he's cleansed and then he offers the offering for the people. Look at verse number 4 once more. It says, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So what does it mean, and no man taketh this honor unto himself? So it's an honorable thing to hold the office of a priest or a high priest, isn't it? It's extremely honorable. That's why he explains, no man taketh this honor unto himself. What does that mean? That means he's not self-appointed. He didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, I'm the high priest now. You know, I'm going to be the high priest no, God is the one who chose him out and selected him in order to fulfill this office. Because it's an important job. It's an extremely important office. So it's, it's explaining that God chose him. He didn't just choose this on himself. He just didn't decide one day, hey, I want to be the high priest. No, God specifically said, I want Aaron to be the high priest. He chose out Aaron to be the high priest. And if you remember, there was a time when Korah, Dathan, and Abiram came, and they're, and they're, and they're you know, gainsaying and speaking against you know, Aaron and Moses himself. And he's basically saying like, hey, you know, and they're of the Levites. They actually had a job. They, I don't know if you, everyone is aware of this when you read it or if, or, or, or if uh, you, know, you know this or not, but they were of the tribe of Levi. They already had a job. And they were already working in the tabernacle, which is better than what the other, you know, all the other tribes. They don't get a part in the tabernacle. You know, wouldn't you like to at least go in the tabernacle and have a full-time job and work there in the tabernacle? Wouldn't you like you know, to, to full-time, full all day, have a ministry working for the Lord. And everything that you do all day long is just spiritual and you're earning all these rewards in heaven. You get to deal with the things of God, right? You know, I loved working full-time at, at the church. I loved it. You know, when I got to all day just work on things. Everything that I did was spiritual. Everything was completely 100% spiritually related. Of course, when you're at work as well, you know, the Bible tells you everything that you do, you shouldn't just serve as unto men, but as unto the Lord. But it's that much sweeter when it's directly relating to souls. When everything that you do is just has to do with... So, so they weren't satisfied with that. So they came and they're gainsaying and saying, Hey, you know, who chose you out? We, basically, they were saying exactly the opposite of this. That, hey, we think that you just chose yourself. We think that you just decided one day that you were going to be, you know, the high priest. So remember they take, the, they take the rod, right? And they put the rod in there and then, you know, they tell them, Hey, you bring your rod and what happened? Aaron's rod budded. It grew out. What was it? Almonds, right? It grew out a branch of almonds. So uh, what did that prove? That was obviously miraculous. That, that proved that th he didn't take this honor unto himself. Aaron didn't take this honor unto himself. God had chosen him. 
And you know, they received uh, a severe punishment because they did that. I want you to go back to Exodus chapter number 28, verse number 1. So if any man's going to be a high priest, he doesn't just choose himself to be that high priest. He just doesn't self-appoint himself. You know, God has to choose you. This is a very high office. This is a very honorable position and an honorable office. And God has to make the decision and put you into this office. So look here in Exodus chapter number 28. We'll see where actually, where the Lord speaks of Aaron being put into this office. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 28. Look at verse number 1. It says this, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. So who chose Aaron? God chose Aaron. And notice how it said in Hebrews 5.1, it says, For every high priest taken from among men. Now you would have noticed that statement there in Exodus 28, verse number 1. It says, And his sons with him from among the children of Israel. It's a very similar statement there. So notice that he is taken from among men. Or they were taken from among men. They were selected from among the children of Israel. And they were given this particular office or this particular ministry and they didn't choose it themselves. God chose them and put them into this office and it's of course an honorable position. So it says back in Hebrews chapter number 5 verse number 4, and no man taketh this honor unto himself but he that is called of God. So God called Aaron and if anyone's ever going to be in this office he has to be called by God. As was Aaron. Verse 5, so also, so in the same way, Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So it's saying in the same way that Aaron was called by God, Christ also was called by God. Because the Bible's very clear. We're learning about this in the, throughout the book of Hebrews. We're going to delve into this tonight. And a lot of the, the uh, you know, chapters to come are also going to speak on this. And that is that Jesus Christ is our high priest. He is our chief priest. And he did not choose this office. on his, him. At, Jesus Christ as a man. The man Christ Jesus didn't just say, Hey, I'm going to be the high priest. But he came and he lived as a man. And God in heaven saw the righteous life that he lived. And he said, you are going to be the high priest. You are going to be the chief priest. He didn't just come and go through the motions. He actually, God, was born as a man, lived as a man, and he proved himself to God. He lived that perfect life, and God in heaven looked down and said, that man is worthy. That man is worthy. I want you to look one more time. Verse number 5, it said this, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Go to Luke chapter number 3. Now that was quoting from Psalm chapter number 2, verse number 7. You know, it says uh, in Psalm chapter 2, verse number 7, I would declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That's the quotation from probably the most famous messianic psalm in the Old Testament. Uh, psalm chapter number 2, there's so many quotations about Jesus from that particular psalm in Psalm chapter number 2. I want you to look with me at Luke chapter number 3. Luke chapter number 3 here, <clears throat> about Jesus being the high priest. And who did it say selected him? God selected him. The Lord in heaven, right? Selected, you know, uh, the Son of God. It was God living as a man, but he was truly a man. He was genuinely a man. He had a birth on this earth. He lived as a man, truly. Luke chapter number 3, I want you to look at me at verse number 21. It says this, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And then it goes on to say this in verse 22, And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Now notice there that this is the Lord speaking. And what does He do? He gives His stamp of approval. Now, Anyone who's familiar with the Bible right here, maybe familiar with the Gospels, what takes place right after he's baptized? Immediately after, a change happens in Jesus' life. What was his profession previous to this? He was a carpenter, but what happens right now? 
Exactly. He goes in the wilderness, but what begins that's different about the next three years of his life than in the previous part of his life? He's no longer a carpenter, is he? He is in the ministry of the Lord, isn't he? He's now in the work of the Lord. And he goes forth and he's serving at, in an office for God. He's sent out right now. And what, what initiated that? Notice that it was the Holy Ghost coming upon him. Now, what took place in the Old Testament when the high priest and the chief priest were, were to begin uh, their, their job or their office? What would take place? They were anointed with oil, weren't they? They would be anointed. Now, oftentimes when someone is anointed with oil in the Old Testament, what also happens at the same time? The Bible says when David was anointed with oil that the, that the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit was upon him from that day forward. So oftentimes at that moment of the anointing of the oil, simultaneously or in tandem with that, the Holy Ghost would come upon them. And that anointing of the chief priest... That was the initiation, or that was their you know, uh, introduction into that office. Right here we see Jesus Christ being inducted into His office or His ministry of the work of the Lord. The Old Testament, what age did the chief priest, what did he have to be? There were requirements, and how old did the high priest or the chief priest have to be? 30 years old. The chief priest had to be 30 years old. Look there at Luke chapter number 3. Look at verse number 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Now I want you to notice that, that Jesus was how old when he began his ministry? He was 30 years old. And what was Jesus? He was our chief priest or our high priest. Priest. He was our spiritual high priest or our spiritual chief priest. And that is, there were requirements to the Old Testament chief, or chief priest and high priest. And what was the age? It was 30 years old. So we can see that right now is him being inducted into that office as the high priest or the chief priest. And he meets the requirements, doesn't he? Notice how it's very clear, it's very specific. He's meeting the standards. It tells you right after he is inducted into the office, the, you know, the Holy Ghost comes upon him. It's like the anointing oil upon Aaron and he's now the high priest. He's now the chief priest. And that was the stamp of approval from God. That was God putting his stamp of approval and saying that, hey, you're not bringing this honor unto yourself. I'm giving you this honor. God was the one that approved him and put him into this office, just like he put Aaron into the office. Uh, also, I want you, so go to Numbers 430. We'll look at this in the Old Testament. Numbers chapter number 4, verse number 30. People will read over these little you know, facts, how it tells you right after he is uh, anointed there with the Holy Spirit, he began to be about 30 years of age. It's easy to read over all this because it's, you know, it's not all written on one page where it's all explained to you, right? These are the, more of the deep things of God. It's not all put down on one page like, hey, you know, Jesus is the high priest. That's why he was 30 years old when he was anointed by oil and then sent him to the ministry. It just calls him the high priest a few times in the book of Hebrews. Then it tells you about, you know, when he began his ministry. Then you have to go back. You've got to study the Old Testament. And you know what a, a Hebrew or a, a Jew that was familiar with the Old Testament would notice when they received the book of Luke? Maybe they read first the book of Hebrews. And they're like, oh, Jesus is my high priest now. He's replacing Aaron. And they're familiar with the standard. They lived it. You know, they went to the temple and things like that. Then they get the book of Luke and they read Luke chapter number 3. Do you know what they think when they see he began to be about 30 years of age? That makes perfect sense because you've got to be 30 years old in order to be in the office of the high priest or the office of the chief priest. It's, it's, you can kind of, when it's preached to you and it's just laid out and kind of just given to you like that, kind of can, you can think, oh, that's simple. But it's not all just put you know, there in front of you like, hey, therefore this, therefore that. You've know, you got to study. That's the importance of studying. Look there in Numbers chapter number 4, verse number 30. It says this. Or, or look at verse 3. I think it's 3 is what pertains to the high priest. Look at verse 3. It says this. From 30 years old and upward, even until 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the con congregation. Now that right there is about the sons of Kohath. But if you go through here, it gives you, you know, uh, verse number 16, here it is. And to the office of, I believe it gives you the age right here. Maybe it's not right there, but you, you, if you jump through here, it gives you the ages repeatedly. Verse number 23, 30 years old and upward until 50. Um, verse number uh, 30, from 30 years old and upward, even unto 50 years old. They're all the same. All of them, it's, it's when they're inducted into this office of high priest, it is meant to be, or those that are doing the work actually in the tabernacle also. 
it's 30 years old to 50. That is the requirement for someone to go in there and to do the work, right? Not a novice, you know, that, that's important. Go back to Hebrews chapter number 5. Hebrews chapter number 5. <clears throat> As I said, that quote there at the end, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, that is quoted from Psalm chapter number 2, verse number 7. And we just read about that in Hebrews 1. It was also quoted in Hebrews chapter number 1. Look at verse number 6. It says this, As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So this is also speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told that this particular quotation that he's quoting from the Old Testament, this citation is also speaking about Jesus. I want you to go back to Psalm chapter number 110. Psalm chapter number 110. So we're doing a lot of, of uh, flipping through the Bible tonight. Psalm chapter number 110. That's a good thing. Amen. Psalm chapter number 110. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 110, look at verse number 1. The Bible says this, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So this is also, uh, Jesus quotes this and he identifies and the Jews even realize that this was a messianic psalm. Because he's like, you know, uh, what think ye of Christ, he says to the Jews. Whose son is he? And then he quotes that, right? So they were aware that's a, that's a quotation or this is a psalm that's about the Christ. Even the, the Jews should have been aware of that. So Psalm 110, when that's being quoted in Hebrews 5, they're going to know that because, keep reading, verse number 2, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength, that's the Messiah, the Messiah's rod, out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. This is prophetic about when Jesus rules on the earth, right? Verse 3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Look at verse 4. This is about the Messiah. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So notice right there again, what do we have? We have Jesus Clearly not taking this honor unto himself, but who? Jehovah choosing out the Messiah and saying, hey, the Messiah is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, you know, this, some of this may not even be in context for you in your mind while you're hearing it, but we have to keep in mind that this is being written to Jews that were probably raised and weren't saved for a period of time. They're getting lost and maybe going down the route of Judaism. They're being taught things of the Old Testament, right? But maybe not in the right context or in the right light. So what Paul is doing right now in Hebrews chapter number 5 is he's explaining why Jesus is the high priest. So basically it begins with this. I believe Jesus is the Messiah. This is what Paul would say. Now I'm going to prove to you that the Messiah is to be a priest. Now we all take that for granted because we've read it in other places in Scripture. But a Jew might have thought the Messiah is the high priest. We all know the high priest has to be of the, of the tribe of Aaron. He has to be of the children of Aaron. But then he goes back and he explains, well hold on a second, I can show you a quotation from the Old Testament where David where David actually says that he is a priest. That the Messiah is a priest. Right? So this may be, you know, for us, we may be thinking, why is he you know, explaining all these things? But to the Jew that maybe is deceived and doesn't understand that the Messiah is also to be a priest, and they're real strict on, hey, it has to be of the line of Aaron, and they don't understand that, hey, the Messiah is not going to come of the line of Aaron. He's going to come of the line of what? David. We all know that. The Jews say that even still today. But even in their Old Testament, if you go back today and they were to say, hey, he couldn't be a high priest, you don't think that a Jew would tell you that today? I guarantee that if you got into you know, a, a sword fight right, with your sword here with a Jew at the door, I guarantee that they would try to tell you, hey, you know, he couldn't be the high priest. High priests are only of the tribe of Levi and of the sons of Aaron. I'd say, hey, let me take you back to Psalm chapter number 110. This is about the Messiah, right? Yeah, that's a messianic psalm, right? Okay, well look what it says in verse number 4 about what you even believe to be about the Messiah. And what does it tell you? Right there it says, The Lord has sworn, is that how it's worded? The Lord hath sworn and will not repent, Thou art a priest forever 
after the order of Melchizedek. So even the Old Testament told you that the Messiah was going to be a high priest. And how long is he going to be a high priest? Forever. How does that make sense? Because he's the Lord. Who is the only person that is eternal? Who is the only person that lives forever? You know, Jehovah said, Thus saith the high and lofty one. And then he goes on to say, I am he that inhabiteth eternity. We need someone that is eternal to be our high priest. That's what we need. So you know the only person that is available for that position, that, has, that meets the qualifications? The Lord himself. The Lord himself became that high priest. Do you know what else we need? We need someone that's righteous. We need someone that's perfect. We need someone that's sinless, right? Because if he's, if he's a sinner, well then he's going to, how is he going to be able to offer the offering for us? He'd have his own sins to pay for, just like the man. Just like the man who was offering the offering, right? Well, you know what else we need? So number one, we need, we need someone to be righteous. Who can, who can do that? Only the Lord. Number two, we need a man. Because if a man has sinned, in order to be just, who has to take that punishment? A man. man you know, humanity is the one who has broken God's commandments and broken, broken God's law, right? God is precise in his judgment. God is a just God. So that means humanity has to take that punishment. So you know what he did? He became humanity. He took on that flesh. That's how it says, for every high priest taken from among men. So it has to be from among men. So you know what he had to do? He had to become a man. So he could be selected from among men, right? And, you know, he lived the perfect life. So at the end of his life, you know, he didn't have any of his own sins to pay for. You know, I couldn't pay for Brother Russell's sins. You know why? Because I got my own problem, right? I, I, I have my own sins, right? So that's why we needed the Lord, who is the only person that is righteous, the only person that is perfect, who didn't have his own sins. He didn't have any sins. And at the end of his life, he could then offer himself as our high priest. He's man. Got to be you know, man to be a high priest. He was chosen from among men. He was selected and chosen out by God. He proved himself and lived those 30 years. And when he met the age to be the high priest... God looked down and said, in whom I am well pleased. Number three, he was righteous. He was perfect. He could then offer himself as the offering for the sins of all mankind. And then also, we need someone who's eternal. We need someone you know, that, that lives forever. And who is the only person that could do that? The Lord. God was the only option. Look at verse number... Uh, 7 now. Go to verse number 7. <clears throat> it says this. Who in the days of his flesh... Now this is talking about Jesus, talking about Christ. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had, when he had offered up prayers and supplications... Supplications is another word for prayer, but it's specifically asking for something. Like, it comes from the word supply. It's, it's asking like to supply my need. That's what a supplication is, right? So it says, offered up prayers and supplications. Watch this with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 26. Matthew chapter number 26 in your Bible. So we're going to look at actually when this took place in Jesus' life. So it explains there that there was a time when Jesus was fearful. There was a time... When Jesus prayed to God, and he prayed to him, and was asking for something, it says supplications, and it says he was crying. Now crying means like yelling. So he was yelling out in his prayers. It says crying and tears. So that's actually what we would refer to as crying. The Bible calls that weeping. So and tears. And it says unto him that was able to save him from death. Now that's a powerful statement. He could have delivered him from that death able to save him from death. And then it says this, and was heard in that he feared. So, did God hear his prayer? He heard and he knew what? Not only did he hear his prayer, he understood and knew the man Christ Jesus, he was afraid. He feared. It's powerful language. Look at Matthew 26. Look at verse number 37. We'll look at actually when this took place. You know, the Garden of Gethsemane before he's arrested, before he's put on the cross. Of course, he's God, so he knows what's about to happen to himself. Verse number 37, it says this, And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful. And then it says this, and very heavy. You know, very heavy is kind of like, you know, the word depressed, right? That's what that means. When something depressed is like something is being pushed down, 
Like very heavy, right? That's what it's saying. He's sorrowful and he's very heavy. Verse 38, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful. No, it's like very. Exceeding sorrowful, <clears throat> even unto death. Where like the point where he feels like he's going to die. He's so sorrowful. Tarry ye here. That means to wait here and watch with me. And then it says, and he went a little further. So he, went, he walked a little bit further than them is what that means. And then it says, and he fell on his face and prayed. So he just drops to the ground and he prayed, saying, Oh my Father. Now what we can learn from Hebrews 5 is that when he prayed, what did he do? He's not praying quietly. He's not praying in his mind. He's yelling. He cried, it said. That means to yell in the Bible. He, so he's crying these words out. He says, Oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, so in spite of that, not as I will, saying not what I want, but as thou wilt. And then it says in verse 40, And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Verse 41, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now that's a powerful time for him to make a statement like that, isn't it? Because Jesus also experienced... Flesh like we experience flesh, right? His flesh was also weak. Now, not unto sin, right? But he still understood what it was like to be sorrowful. He still understood what it was like to be tired. He still understood what it was like to be afraid. These are all emotions that come with a humanity and being a man, isn't it? He fully experienced what it was like to be a man. He wasn't just going through the motions. He wasn't just a robot. And this is something oftentimes that Christians don't understand. Because we all understand very clearly that it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, you know, if you believe not that I am he shall die in your sins. It was God in the flesh. But sometimes we forget he was actually a man. He wasn't just going through the motions. It wasn't just God and he's just like, you know, coasting his way through and this is going to be cake. Just wait until I got to pay for their sins and get back into glory. He actually lived like a man. He felt all of the same emotions that you feel and that I feel. He did everything that you do in your life. That has to do with just, outside of sin, he did everything that has to do with humanity. All of it. You know what you see here in the Garden of Gethsemane is you see in full force the man Christ Jesus. Where he fully and truly is a man. It's, he's not going through, it's not like you know, an avatar, right? He's not playing a video game with himself down there. He's there and he knows what it's like. You know what? Jesus was afraid. And you know what he was saying? If there's any way out of this, please just let me get out of it. If there's anything possible that can happen where I don't have to go through with this, please just get me out of this. But was there? He said that he could have saved him from death. He prayed unto him that was able to save him from death. But was there anything, anything that he could do? To, to take, was it possible for him to let that cup pass from him? If he would have, do you know what the result would be? Every man that ever lived, every woman that ever lived, every person that ever lived would die and go to hell. This is, this was the plan of salvation for all of humanity. Amen. This is the plan. Do you know what that tells you? There's no other way of salvation but completely through Jesus Christ. 100%. That is the only route of salvation. It's not just, well, you can kind of be good. No. He was able to save him from death, but he didn't. Do you know why? Because that was necessary for you to go to heaven. And that's the only way. Is there any other route? No, son, you have to die. This is what has to happen. If there would have been, he would have spared his son. He was able to save him from death. Do you think he would have just let him die? If, hey, here, if he could just, if God could just give us some other way to get to heaven, do you think he would have allowed his son, like, Whoops, you know, you know, they can actually go this way, but you know, you learned a lot going through that, right? That's silly, right? It's the only way of salvation. It's not by being good. It's not by living a good life. It's not by, hey, I'm good and Jesus. No, it's 
what Jesus did. Right. And there's no way out of it. He was able to save him from death. He was crying to him saying, please. I mean, if you had a son that was in a situation like this, you as a man, wouldn't you do what? You'd pull the plug immediately as just a man, wouldn't you? Okay. You'd, you'd get him out of it. If you were watching your son, obviously God is perfect and this would be you in error and not thinking of other people, right? But if you had a son that's suffering like that and crying out and saying, dad, please just help me, what would you do? Game over. Come up. Come home. Wouldn't you? Immediately. That's what I would do. I love my children. Right? I'm sure that's what you would do. But do you know what he did? Jesus went through it. And he allowed him to go through it for you. Amen. So that shows you how much. It, it, you know, there's a great expression of God's love through allowing his son to go through this suffering. And allowing his son to die on that cross. It just shows how much God loves us, that the Father was willing to sacrifice His Son for the sins of the whole world. Because He says this, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But did He let the cup pass from Him? The cup represents what He has to do, right? You know what God, the cup often represents in the Bible when God has a cup? The wrath. And do you know what's about to be poured out on him? God's wrath. God's wrath upon the sins of all of mankind. He put it upon his son. That's important to understand because I'm going to explain to you something that people will misunderstand. Go back to Hebrews 5. Because it says at the end, Unto him that was able to save him from death. And then it says, And was heard in that he feared. So he was, he was fearful, wasn't he? Now, to be fearful is listed in Revelation 21.8. It's a sin. To be fearful. But there is an exception. There is someone that you should fear. Do you know who you should fear? The Lord. And God. Do you know what he was afraid of? That cup. Do you know what that cup was? The judgment of God. God's wrath. That's what he was afraid of. He was afraid of going to the cross. And what was the cross? It was your punishment. It was the wrath of God. I've heard people try to... This seems like Jesus is sinning because we're not supposed to be afraid of anything. You know? No, no, no. You're not supposed to fear man, which is not able to, you know, which is only able to kill body and then can't do anything else. But rather, the Bible says, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. It's a commandment to fear the Lord. We're told over and over again all throughout the Bible, you should be afraid of God. You're a fool if you're not afraid of God. You look at all the judgments and the, the wrath that God pours out on people that are disobedient and live a sinful life. You're a fool if, you're not, if you don't fear God. You should be afraid of God. Look, go read the book of Revelation a couple times, and I guarantee the next time you see me, you'll say, all right, I fear God now. I mean, you see God's judgments. He's powerful. I mean, He's the creator of all the world. You know, He's, he's so, so much more supreme and higher than every being that you could even imagine. You could even dream up in your mind. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. We should fear the Lord because of His power. Uh, look at verse number 8 now. It says this, <clears throat> Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience uh, by the things which he suffered. Now I want to point out one thing to you here. Look at the beginning of verse 8 again right there. It says this, Though he were a son. So notice that that's referring to a specific point in time. Right? Though he were a son. Verse number 7. Look at what it says in verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh... So right here in verse number 7, verse number 8, they're both referring to a specific point in time. It's trying to tell, tell you about a certain time with the Lord, with Jesus. And what is it specifically talking about? Well, verse 7 says what? The days of his flesh. And when was that? When he was on this earth as a man. You know, he hasn't always had flesh. That's silly and foolish. There was, day, there was the days of his flesh, right? You know... Um, if he was always in flesh, it, you wouldn't be able to pinpoint a specific time. He's trying to pinpoint down a certain time for him. It would be like saying, you know, hey, you know, Pastor Baker, you know, uh, when did you do something just randomly about your life? And I was like, in the days of my flesh. Now, for me, that's ridiculous to say because that's all that I, that's the only time that I've ever existed, right. isn't it? Well, you're like, well, that really tells me when, right? That doesn't make any sense. But for Jesus... When you say, in the days of his flesh, if you understand that that's referring to his life on this earth, and prior to that he was never in the flesh, well then you're like, oh, right there when he was alive on this earth, right? But if he was always eternally in, flat, in the flesh, he's like, yeah, it took place in the days of his flesh. You're like, well, when? I mean, that's all of eternity, right? And people try to say, well, you know, Jesus has eternally been flesh. That is so stupid. 
The Bible says the Word was made flesh. There was a time when He was made flesh. God became a man. There was a time when He took on flesh, right? And that's what that's teaching. And not only that, once you understand, you know, that there was a time when He took on flesh. And then you look at verse number 8, it says, though He were a son. When? It's referring to a certain time. What is it saying? His flesh. Do you know what the Son is? It's referring to God in the flesh. The Son of God is God. But more specifically, it's God when He became a man. And He had a birth. Right? A son has a birth. And He was born on this earth. That is the Son of God. Though He were a flesh, when is that? Oh, I'm sorry. Though He were a son, when is that? In the days of His flesh. That's when He was a son. In the days of His flesh. That's what it's teaching. That's what it's saying. You know, the sonship of Christ is not something that took place, you know, all throughout eternity. The Son is specifically God who is born as a man. You, know, you can't have a son without a mother, right? And he was born of Mary. And when these people, it's so ridiculous. I see Brother Anthony laughing because he's like envisioning this in his mind. It's so ridiculous when people try to say that Jesus has always been the Son. You know, before the foundations of the world, he was a son. He was the son. Well, let me ask you this question. Who was the mother? Who was his mom? If he was a son, he came forth at one point, didn't he? Nah, he's just eternally been a son. That defies the definition of son. That doesn't even make sense. The definition of a son is someone that who is, it is brought forth. And they want to try, people that, that will attack us on this doctrine, oh, you don't believe in the eternal sonship of Christ, they'll try to act like we're being blasphemous. No, they're the ones that's being blasphemous because what you are implying, if you say that he is in eternity past, brought forth or begotten, or in eternity past he was a son, a son has a beginning. A son has a beginning. My position is sealed tight. You know why? Because his beginning is his flesh. But prior to that, he was God. Now, if you want to start trying to say that in eternity past, he was begotten, or in eternity past, before the foundations of the world, he was a son, do you know what you're saying? That he was brought forth at one point in eternity past. And he's this other person beside the Father. It's bizarre. It's, 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 a, it's paganism is what it is. You know, this trash comes from the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church is Roman paganism. Just drop the Catholic. That's what they are. Roman paganism. That's what they are. They took their teachings of, of Greek mythology and Roman mythology. And they tried to smash Christianity together with it. And you know what they got? That's why they worship idols. That's Roman paganism. That's why they worship goddesses. Like Mary, and they pray to her and bow down to her. That's what they did in Roman paganism. That's why they do all these weird things that you can't find in the Bible. All these weird rituals and stuff. But you know where you will find it? Roman paganism. Greek pe paganism. That's why they, they revere all of the saints. And they have all these statues. You ever look at the type of architecture that they have in their churches? Have you seen that kind of stuff? Do you know where else you'll find that? Some Roman temples, that's where you'll find it. It matches up perfectly. If you look inside there, that's exactly what it looks like. It looks like a Roman temple with all these saints that they're praying to. That's paganism. And that's, where this, that's how this teaching crept into real biblical Christianity of this eternal sonship. No, you have God, the one and only true God, one person, the Father, our Father. That one true God became a man. Amen. That is who the Son of God is. Amen. That is the man Christ Jesus. Right. He's not some second person where there's two people next to each other in eternity past, the Father and the Son. You know, where's, where's the mom? It makes no sense. It, it defies the definition of son. It's always been a son. It's always been his son. He's my Father. And I'm his son. I've just eternally been this way. We've eternally had this relationship. It's, it's ridiculous. It's stupid. It's nonsensical is what it is. Let's just throw out definitions. We don't even need definitions anymore. But you know, if you embrace Roman Catholic paganism, it makes perfect sense. Because then you have Mary, the goddess, who's the mother that eternally brought forth, you know, the son. You know, that's trash. That's not biblical. Right, right. The Son is the days of His flesh. The Son of God is He who came forth from Mary. It was God born as a man. 
You know, this is just another example of many in the book of Hebrews. That's why I said in the beginning, I don't know if everyone remembers this, it's strong on the sonship of Christ and it's strong on the deity of Christ. It mentions it many times. It talks about how he's a son. You can learn from it, him being the son and also him being God or being the Lord. Okay, uh, look, at, look at verse number uh, 9 now. Uh, one, I want to focus on one thing in verse 8. I went on a little longer on that than I had planned on, but it says this, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. So he was able to learn obedience, because he was able to be in subjection. This proves that he was not always, some people, those same people teach that he's eternally in subjection and always had been in the past in subjection to the Father. That means that he would have been in obedience to the Father as a second person, right? Well, how, why would he be specifically mentioning that in the days of his flesh he learned obedience if he was previously already obedient to that? That wouldn't be anything new. He would have already been obedient and he wouldn't be learning obedience now. So that, again, you see that position just makes no sense when you really start to... When it can't hold up to Scripture when it, you scrutinize it. So he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Verse 9, it says this, And being made perfect, that's complete, right? He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So notice, being made perfect, being made complete. He became the author of eternal salvation. Remember, he's referred to in Hebrews 12 as the author and finisher of our faith. Here he's the author of eternal salvation. What is salvation? It's eternal. It's everlasting. It's never ending. If you have salvation, you know how long you have it? Eternal. Amen. Eternally. Because salvation is eternal. As soon as you're saved, you know how long you're saved for? Forever. Amen. It's eternal salvation. There is no other type of salvation, right? Unless you're talking about a false salvation. Maybe, you know, that salvation is not eternal. But true salvation, the Bible says it's eternal salvation. Jesus is very clear. He said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Amen. The Bible's super clear about that. But then it says this, unto all them that obey him. I want you to go to Romans chapter number 16 because people that believe a false gospel and they defy and reject all the clear scriptures in the Bible like, you know, Romans 3.28. You know, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Right? What does that say? We're, we're saved by faith alone without the deeds of the law. The deeds of the law, the works of the flesh, trying to be good, being baptized, all commandments, every commandment. The Bible's real clear, every commandment of the law we're not saved by. Loving your neighbor, none of that. That's not what saves us because no man can keep all the law. No man could ever do that. That's why Jesus came to fulfill the law. That's why he's the author of eternal salvation, right? And, you know, people will, what they will do is they'll take verses like what you just read, where it says, unto all them that obey him, and what will they say? You have to just be in continual obedience to, to Jesus, or you're not going to heaven. Now, who in here actually thinks that you can be in continual obedience to Jesus, that you will never disobey Jesus? You're going to live the rest of your life, Daniel apparently, is going to live the rest of your life without ever disobeying Jesus. You are a prideful fool if you think that. There isn't a chance. No one is going to be, not a chance, are you going to be able to be in continual obedience to God? No way. There are so many commandments. A lot of people don't even know all the commandments in the Bible. There are so many commandments in the Bible. You know, you're going to disobey a lot. It doesn't make it okay, but you're going to disobey the Lord. And we should never do it purposely and knowingly. And we should try not to sin, but no one is going to be able to live a sinless life. It's not going to happen, right? But people will teach this false gospel like, hey, you've got to keep the commandments, right? you got to be, and they'll go to verses like that and they'll say, see, you have to obey him. But what does it mean? What are you obeying? That's what's important. Because there's the commandments of the law, but then there's also the commandment to believe the gospel. So you have two ways to get to heaven. You have the commandments of the law, be perfect, but then you also have the way that Christ made for us, the death, burial, and resurrection, and just believing on Him. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. When Jesus went preaching, when He was sent into His ministry, right after He was baptized, we read, He went out, He went into the wilderness, and He went out preaching and commanded men to repent and believe the gospel. That wasn't a suggestion, that was a commandment. That's not of the law. That is the commandment to believe and to obey the gospel. 
right? This is, the, this is the law of faith, the Bible says. Not the works of the law or the commandments of the Old Testament, right? You have the Old Covenant, which is all of the laws of thou shalt not kill, all that. Then you have the New Covenant. There's only one re requirement and one commandment in the New Covenant. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So, is obedience still required for the New Covenant? Is there an obedience that's required? Yes. Because what do you have to do? You have to believe. And if you don't believe, guess what? You are disobedient. You're disobedient. So, you know, when we have a clear verse that tells us, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Are we going to take a verse that just says, hey, you know, he's the, uh, uh, it doesn't say captain there. What does it say? The author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Are we going to say, well, you've got to obey the commandments? No, we already have the clear verse that tells us. The real clear verse. So does it make sense to, to throw that clear verse out and to say that obey them there means to keep the commandments? It doesn't make any sense. That phrase, obey him, or to obey the gospel, is used all throughout the Bible. I want you to look here in Romans chapter number 16, and I'll show you that. Look at verse number 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, verse 26, but now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets, watch this, according to the commandment of the everlasting God. So is this a commandment? It's a commandment, isn't it? Watch this. The commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of what? Faith. The obedience of faith. Do you know what we have to obey when it comes to Jesus and it comes to the new covenant? And that's what this is talking about, the new covenant, right? What is it talking about? We have to be obedient. When we go and knock on somebody's door, when we walk away from that door, that person is either obedient or they're disobedient. You have to obey Jesus, right? The Bible says when it's talking about people that are going out and preaching the gospel, it says, as though God did beseech you by us. What you are doing when, when, a, when a, a, an ambassador, someone who is sent on behalf of Jesus, comes to your door, they preach you the gospel and you say, not interested. You know what you just did? You disobeyed him, Jesus. You know, his, his ambassador came and gave you the message from Jesus and you said, I'm not interested. And you know what you didn't receive? Eternal salvation. You rejected the everlasting commandment of believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I just thought of this. We're going to go to it quickly. I don't want to go on too long. Go to, I believe it's, uh, go to 1 Peter first. I think it's 1 Peter. I don't know if it's 1 Peter or 2 Peter, but I want you to look at this. 1 Peter. <clears throat> yeah, 1 Peter chapter number... Six, it says this, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and then it says this, And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So notice, he that believes on him is not confounded, right? And then it says, verse 7, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, now watch this, but unto them which be disobedient. The stone which the builders disallowed, the same has become the head of the corner. Notice, what is it? Someone who believed, they obeyed the gospel. What did the other person do? They were disobedient. Why? Because they did not believe. So when it talks about unto them that obey him, what do you have to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do when he, when he went around? Did, did Jesus ever go around trying to tell people to be good to get to heaven? No, he went around preaching the gospel and he said, repent and believe the gospel. Repent means to change your mind. So he's saying, believe the gospel. That's what you have to obey. That was the message that he preached. That's what Jesus preached. He preached the gospel. He preached the message of salvation through faith. And you receive Amen. eternal salvation. Go to Hebrews chapter number 5 again. We're going to have to hurry up a little bit now. Hebrews chapter 5. So it says, unto all them that obey him. We obey him through faith. Chapters 3 and 4 were super clear. It's by faith that we just read as well. So, you, you know, you have to be deluded. You have to be, you have to have this false gospel just shoved down your throat for years and years and years to take these verses and try to twist them like that. It's not what it's teaching. It's, it's crazy. It defies all of Scripture. Uh, verse number 11, it says, Of whom, no, I'm sorry, verse 10, Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus was called of God. He didn't take this honor onto himself. To be a high priest, and high priest, it says, after the order of Melchizedek. So it's, it's saying after the order, it means in the same way. 
It talks about how the order of Aaron. That means that you would be in the same way of Aaron, right? The order of Aaron as a high priest would be in the way or the manner of Aaron or how he was a priest, right? In this way, it's saying after the order in the same way of Melchizedek. That's referring to him being eternal because he is an eternal high priest. Jesus is, is, is eternal because he is God. Look at verse 11. Of whom, that's talking about Christ, we have many things to say and hard to be uttered. Seeing ye are dull of hearing. So he says, of whom, talking about Christ, we have many things to say. We have a lot that we could say about Christ, right? We have, there's a lot that you could be taught about Jesus. And hard to be uttered. Now, some people may read that first and say, oh, it means that they're, it's hard to speak these things. It's hard to tell you these things. No, that's not what it means because it says this. Seeing, so now it's going to explain to you what that means. Seeing ye are dull of hearing. So you know why it's hard to be uttered? Is because you're having, you know, you are having trouble understanding. You know, have you ever tried to explain something to, a, you know, a child maybe? And that's a perfect example actually. And it's, it's hard to be uttered because you're just trying to break it down to their level and explain it in a way. You try to explain it like ten times in this way and that way. It's hard to be uttered, right? Now, could you explain that concept to an adult very easily? Of course. But because a child is dull of hearing, they're having trouble understanding it, these things are hard to be uttered, right? He's actually right now likening them unto children. He's saying, I could teach you so much, but these things are hard to be uttered. I could teach you so much about Jesus, but they're hard to be uttered because you don't understand very well. Look at verse number 12 now. For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers... Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now notice he says, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers. Ought there means should. It says you should be teachers. Saying you have need that one teach you again. Now why does he say that? Because unto the Jews or unto the Hebrews was committed the oracles of God, the Bible says in the book of Romans. You know, the Bible asks the question, you know, you know, so is there any advantage? What, you know, what advantage hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? I believe it's Romans 3, verse 1. And, there, and, and, and he, he responds, you know, chiefly, much, every way. He says, chiefly because that unto them was committed the oracles of God. So he says, there's a lot of prophets, but mainly, chiefly means, you know, like this is the big thing, right? He's saying mainly that unto them was given the oracles of God. What is oracles? Like something you know, is oral, it's saying it's from your mouth. It's talking about the words. That's the oracles. So he's saying that they had the scriptures. So did they have any excuse not to know the Bible? None at all. Instead of having someone teach them, they should be teaching other peoples. They had the advantage. There was an advantage of being a Jew. There was an advantage of being a Hebrew. They had the word of God handed to them and they had all of these advantages. And you know, the Bible says... Unto whom much is given, of him shall much be required. So if a person is given a lot, if you have a lot of advantages, there's ex more expected of you. Right. More is expected of you, and that's why Paul is digging into them right now. I mean, that's insulting, isn't it? He's explaining to them, hey, i got a lot of things that I could teach you. But these things are hard to be spoken or hard to be uttered because you're dull of hearing. I mean, he's rebuking them, saying, because you can't understand me. There's a lot more that I could teach you if you were able to hear it, but you're not. And he says, for when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. So they're, not only are they not teachers, they are so sophomoric or so elementary in their understanding of the word of God that they need to be taught the first principles of the oracles of God. They need to be taught the foundational truths, the basic things of the Bible. Look further what he says right here. Look at the very end. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now, who drinks milk? Babies. Babies. Who eats meat? Men. Men, that's right, right? That's the difference. Milk and meat, it's talking about the difference between a baby and a grown man or a grown woman. That's the difference. What's he calling them? Babes. Saying, you're like a baby. Is he, is he being nice to them? I mean, you've got to think about this. You know, we kind of read over this stuff. 
Would you like to receive a letter like this? You know? You have need, you know, right there at the end he says, how does he word it? And or become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. He's like, you need to be, you know, that's something that, what, that especially kids when you're younger and right when you're trying to learn how to, you know, talk smack or talk crap to somebody else, you'll make fun of them like they're a baby, right? You know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you drink, I'll do this with the kids all the time, like especially the boys that like think they're big, like Jeremiah. I always like mess with him. You need a binky, you know what I mean? That's, you know, he obviously hates that kind of crap talk, you know? And I'll talk to him like, hey, let me get you a baba. You know, when he's still wearing diapers, when he's got to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you know, I'll mess with him about that. Oh, you got your diaper on? Ah, let's get you a baba. Is he sleeping? Oh, he's lucky, yeah. Yeah, so I'll just mess with him about that. He hates that. You know, and nobody wants to be called a baby, even a four-year-old, right? He despises it. And what's Paul doing? He's like, you need to be drinking out of your mother's breast. That's what he's saying. He's like, he's like, oh, you want a steak? Not for you, buddy. Here's the milk. It's insulting. Sometimes you read over this stuff, but you don't realize, like, it's a rebuke. People need to stop being so soft and just take a rebuke. People do not need to stop being so proud, and when you're wrong, you just accept the rebuke. You understand that, hey... You know what? I should be further along in my Christian life than I am right now. You know what, Paul? You're right. You know what you need to start doing? You know what the right response would be? Start reading your Bible. Man. Start reading your Bible. And the next time Paul shows up, don't be on the milk. You know, you, don't, you know, the bad response would be to just keep being the same type of Christian that you are right now. And what do you think Paul's going to say when he shows up again? Same thing. It's like, are you kidding me? Didn't I warn you about this? And you have it. What have you learned? How much more scripture have you memorized? How many more times have you read your Bible? You know, what do you know new from the Bible? What have you learned in your spiritual life? Right? What more have you learned? And they're just like, well, you know, just trying to make up and fluff up their answer, but there's nothing there. And they're like, you know what? You go sit at the kids' table with your bottle and your chicken nuggets, and I'm going to go over here and order a steak and a baked potato with zucchini or asparagus. Now I'm going to get a big boy meal, and I don't want a baby meal. I want a, I want a grown man meal. You know, it's insulting. That's what I point I want to get across. It's insulting. And when Christians get to this point in their life where they, you know, they've been studying their Bible... You know, uh, uh, for, for, let's say, or they've been saved. Let me word it this way. They've been saved for many, many years, but they just don't know anything. It's embarrassing. And one of the things about, and this is one of the things that I want to change. This isn't happening in our church. Is you go into these Baptist churches and there's a lot of hoary heads. Hoary means gray. I didn't just curse behind the pulpit or say something bad, right? There's a lot of gray heads in there in Baptist churches. They got the right gospel. They're saved. But do you know what? If you sit down next to most of those people and started talking Bible with them, do you know what you'd realize quick? It's embarrassing. Yeah. You, don't, you don't hardly know anything, do you? Do you ever read your Bible? I'm, I would venture to say that 95% of Baptist saved Christians in the United States have never read their Bible cover to cover. I'm talking Baptists that go to church. Not one time have they read from Genesis... 95% have started Genesis 1 and finish, finished in Revelation 22. That is embarrassing. And you know what? You should be ashamed. If that's you, you should be ashamed. You deserve someone to tell you to get off the breast milk. To, you know, you know, that's what you need. You're not going to, you know, whatever you know, uh, uh, correction you're receiving now is not, obviously not enough. And nowadays people are so sensitive and they don't want to correct people. That's how you get people to get it right. right. Is you give them hard reproof or hard correction. And then they walk away thinking, man, I'm an idiot. I don't want to be told that again. Yeah. I don't want that to happen to me again. You know, <clears throat> you know, my daughter has even said that before. We've had that discussion. And she's told me, you know, when, that the, the times when she most mostly wants to like fix problems is when like I eat into her the most. She's like, I hate that. You know? It makes you want to fix it and that's what it should do. But you know what it does to the prideful person? They just harden up. Like, how dare you? 
And today we just have a bunch of sensitive snowflakes who can't take correction, so they just keep making the same errors over and over and over again. Instead of receiving the correction, humbling yourself, and fixing the stinking problem. Fix it. Stop being a baby. And you're like, oh, no, stop calling me a baby. No, stop being a baby. Right. Be a grown man. Grow up. If you're a baby, you deserve to be called a baby. That's what you need me to tell you. What do you want me to tell you? You want me to lie to you? That's not going to fix the problem. What you need to be told is the cold, hard, honest truth so that you can fix the problem. That's what you need. Amen. If you're being a baby, you need to be told, stop being a baby. Stop drinking your mother's milk and start eating some big boy food. Amen. Consume the milk faster. Drink it faster and, and, and move on. Look at what it says next. Look there in verse number uh, 12. It says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. This is all, like, this is a sharp correction. You read over this, but he is sharply reproving them and sharply correcting them, saying, you're unskillful. He, ju he just told them, you're on the milk. Now he's saying, you know, anyone who's on the milk, they're unskillful in the word of righteousness. You're unskillful. The Bible is referred to right before this in, in uh, Hebrews 4.12. What was it called? Sword. You know, that's what you would be. You would be someone going forth into battle that doesn't know how to use your sword. That's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. Can you imagine if someone, you know, being a soldier or something and, and, you know, and they've been a soldier for like 15 years and they still don't know how to use their sword? It's like, what? Do you, that's what Christians are doing. Been saved for 15 years and they don't know how to use the sword. You, could, you start cutting into them and they're pre trib, right? They wouldn't, it don't matter with that thing, that dinky little thing, it's going in the trash, anyways. But they don't even know how to defend it. They don't even know how to use their sword to even defend what they do believe, even if it's wrong. They don't know how to use it, they have no idea how to battle. You can tell when you start debating with someone whether somebody knows how to use that sword or not. And when somebody doesn't, and they're a gray-headed old man, I've had this happen many times, and they're just not able to, you know, to contend. It's just like, pfft, pfft, game over. It's embarrassing when they're old like that. It really is. They just don't know the Bible, can't even give the gospel. 55, 60 years old, and don't even know how to give the gospel. It's embarrassing. Imagine getting to heaven, seeing one guy who's got... Thousands of people saved in his life. And you got saved when you were 10, 11 years old as a child. And you are standing there in heaven, lived a long life, 75, 80 years, didn't get a single person saved. Never read the Bible cover to cover. Never grew in the knowledge of the Bible. Didn't learn crap. It's embarrassing. Yeah. It's embarrassing. Look at verse 14. We're going to end there. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. That's someone that's mature. That's what that means. A grown man. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So notice that it says that even those who by reason of use. This is important. They're using it. Who by reason of use have their senses exercised to, to discern both good and evil. You have to use it. You ever heard the term, you know, you, you uh, use it or you'll lose it, right? If you, if you memorize, you know, I've, I memorized uh, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. I'm going to give you, I'm going to use myself as a bad example right now, right? I couldn't quote to you 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, let alone any of the rest of those. I memorized the three books, pastoral epistles, and I had those memorized for like two years, both of them, or all three of them. And I had multiple other chapters memorized on top of that. You know, uh, you know uh, at, I think it was like, I think the count was like 52, or maybe it was more than that even, at one point, 54. It was a lot of chapters. And those three books, I mean, I have some other chapters memorized still now. I don't remember them at all. If you start quoting them, I'll be able to finish them. But I, don't, I couldn't quote to you those books. You know why? Because I stopped, I stopped using it. I stopped doing it daily. You know, you'll, you will forget it. If you're not using your Bible, if you just completely got out of church, you stopped reading your Bible, you stopped and, you know, actually putting those things into practice, you're not going to remember them. You're not going to be able to just jump back into the fight immediately and be just as skillful with the Word as you were before. It's not going to happen. 
the Christian life is a battle. It's not just this, you know, let's go and have fun. It's just a social club. No, we're battling. When we go door to door, I'm knocking on the door of a Jehovah's Witness. I got a sword in my hand. That's right. You know what I mean? And I'm there fighting with you with doctrine. Amen. And I'm using that sword. And you should be too. And you need to be skillful with it. You need to know how to use it. You need to take them to Isaiah 9, 6. The mighty God, even in your, your Bible. Right? It's not a Bible, but, you know, give them that. You need to be able to show them these things. You know, you knock on the door of a Pentecostal that thinks they can lose their salvation. You need to have some, some ammo there. You need to be using it. You need to be prepared. It's a real battle. That's why it's likened unto a sword. Right? That, w that, you know, that only makes sense because we're in a war. And you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? But against principalities, powers. You know, it's the spiritual darkness of this world. It's a wicked world out there. A wicked, sinful world. And you will succumb to sin. You'll, you, you'll, you'll uh, uh, you know, make yourself look like a fool with other people not knowing the Word of God. You'll lose opportunities to give good counsel to maybe friends that you know. Maybe there's a saved person that needs good counsel. But you're, so, you're, you're such a babe and immature in the Word of God, you give them terrible advice. That's your fault. Shame on you. Learn your Bible. Study your Bible. Study the Word of God. Be able to give some godly counsel. Amen. And stay up on it. Use it. You, gotta, you can't just be this person that just reads it too. You're just reading it and you're not quoting it. You're not putting it into practice. That's why it says, who by reason of use, who by reason of use, hath, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So you've got to use it. You've got to be putting it into practice, quoting the scriptures. Don't, you memorize the scripture and you don't quote them, you're going to forget them. You've got to quote them. You memorize a verse, you memorize a concept, you, you, you understand like a certain virtue or a principle that's taught from the pulpit, use it. Put it into practice right away. It's not, I'm not preaching to you to make you feel good. I'm not Joel Osteen. I'm here trying to actually help you. Amen. So what you do is you take these messages, you take these nuggets, and you use them. Or you're just going to forget them. They're not going to benefit you at all. They're not going to help you in your life at all. You know, Take the truths and put them into practice. If you find something in the Word of God, use it immediately. Try to find an area to use it, whatever it is. If you learn something, use it, or you will lose it. Let's not be babes. I'm, I will not let this church uh, be a church where it's a bunch of gray-headed men that don't know the Bible. Gray-headed women that don't know the Bible. Women that aren't able, like it tells you in Titus 2, to teach the younger women. Men who aren't able to teach the, the younger men. Men who aren't able to show the, the, the new converts how to go soul winning. That is not going to happen here. It, I'll tell you why it's not going to happen. Because... I'm going to preach the Bible, and I'm going to make sure that you're not on the milk. I'm going to preach the Word of God. But, you know, that's not enough, too, because you have to read it on your own. Because sometimes there are, there are pastors that do preach the Word of God, and then they don't, the, the, the congregants, the hearer of the Word, they don't actually put it into practice, do they? They don't read the Bible on their own, either. But, so you have to do that, too, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do as, as well. I'm going to reprove and rebuke that person. And if it is you, then you'll... If it's not you, then I'm not reproving or rebuking you. But if you're a babe, if you've never gotten anybody saved, if you don't read your Bible often, it's time to get off the milk. It's time to take that next step. This is what you need to do in your Christian life. You need to stop... You need to move on from these first principles of the oracles of God. You need to move on from the foundation. You're still doing addition in kindergarten. That's what's going on. You know? Move up from the kitty table and start eating some steak. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the rebukes. Dear Lord, there are things that I read all the time that rebuke me, dear God. And help us to have a humble heart where we can respond to it in humility and fix the problem. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you uh, that, it's, that it's forthcoming and it's, it's very uh, uh, straightforward and it's with plainness of speech that you warn us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and all of his sufferings and, and how he was, he was able to go through uh, with everything and that, he, and that uh, he went through with it he finished it to the end and he was perfected as it says. He was completed and he became the author of eternal salvation. We thank you for salvation that's eternal. We ask you to be with us. Bless our church. 
Uh, bless the visitor that came tonight. Bless all the members. Uh, bless uh, all the children. We love you so much. Be with us and keep us safe. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.